Six days from now, Seattle voters will pass judgment on initiative number one, which could well determine the future of one of the city's best-known landmarks, the Pike Place Market. Good evening, I'm Jack Eddy. Tonight, Channel 4 Special News Unit takes a look at that landmark and the competing efforts being made, supposedly, to save it. The city of Seattle proposes to save the market by proceeding with a large-scale urban renewal project covering a total of nearly 23 acres. Within that area, market buildings covering a total of 1.7 acres would be set aside for restoration. Opposing the city's plan is a group known as the Friends of the Market, which, while in favor of urban renewal, feels that the area designated for restoration is too small. Accordingly, the Friends have placed on the ballot an initiative which would create a historical district covering a total of seven acres. Stated in those terms, the issue seems clear enough. During the past few weeks, it has grown increasingly cloudy. Voters are now being wooed not only by the city and the friends of the market, but by such groups as the Committee to Save the Market and the Alliance for a Living Market. Each group, moreover, claims that the methods endorsed by its opponents will not really save the market, but will instead destroy it. During the next 30 minutes, we'll examine these various groups, their makeup, motives, and their proposals. In the process, we'll try to shed some light on the confusing question of who, in fact, is trying to save the market. The Pike Place Market was formally established in 1907, when Mayor Charles Case invited local farmers to bring their wagons to town and peddle their wares. Soon, the market became the city's favorite shopping place, a status it retained for the next 40 years. Following the Second World War, the market suffered a brief decline as city residents fled to the suburbs. But during the 60s, as controversy developed over the market's future, the shoppers began to return. By 1966, the market's annual sales had climbed to more than $10 million. And today, on any given Saturday, the market is apt to be the liveliest place in town. The area surrounding the market, however, has not fared nearly so well. Only two buildings have been constructed there in the last 40 years, and some of the older buildings are dilapidated beyond repair. Recently, two hotels in the neighborhood were closed. During the past 20 years, conditions such as these have prompted numerous schemes for the area's renewal. In 1963, for example, a powerful group of downtown businessmen known as the Central Association drew up a comprehensive plan for the downtown development. In the area around Pioneer Square, this plan, along with subsequent additions, called for parking lots and high-rise office buildings. In the Pike Place area, it envisioned apartment towers, office buildings, and a major hotel. Soon after it was issued, the association's plan was adopted by the city council, and in 1966, the city applied for federal funds to redevelop the area around Pike Place. This area, as delineated in the city's application, runs along First Avenue from Union Street on the south to Lenora Street on the north. The project's western boundary is the Alaskan Way Viaduct. As soon as federal planning funds were made available, the city hired a Los Angeles consulting firm to do an economic study of what should be built within the project. Then the city hired architects Paul Kirk and John Morris to draw up an illustrative design. In planning its design, the Kirk Morris team was closely bound by the economic study, which more or less endorsed what the Central Association had originally proposed. Well, it was absolutely the control of the program. The, uh, as we received the study, we, we didn't receive a definitive program other than the economic analysis that described the kinds of buildings, the kinds of areas that could be built that could then be funded and built as, in an economical manner. So it was the program information. Based on these efforts, and the efforts of a citizen's advisory committee, the city then established a land use plan for the project area. As portrayed in the Kirk Morris design, the city's plan looks like this. At the center of the project are the renovated market buildings, and to the south is a low-rent apartment development. To the north of the market is a hotel of more than 500 rooms, and north of that, a row of apartment towers up to 30 stories high. Below the hotel and apartment towers would be a 4,000-car garage. Total cost of the project, more than $100 million, of which about 10% would be provided by the federal government. The final decision as to how all this money should be spent would be subject to review by a five-man board of experts in the field of urban design, all of them from outside Seattle. 
Paul Kirk, one of the city's most highly regarded architects, tells why he thinks his design is a good one. I think its main virtue is that it does save the market. Uh, and I think this is something that we'd want to have per, uh, clearly understood. We think the other strong points of the, of the project are, of course, that it does give an opportunity to bring people into a downtown uh, area for their residential use by an urban renewal area. It means streets and public areas can be turned, uh, turned over to public plaza areas with these big vistas out across the sound and the mountains, which is not possible without an urban renewal project. I think these are the strong points. In the three years since it was first unveiled, the city's urban renewal plan has attracted some powerful supporters. Most visible of these is the city itself, which at public expense has printed thousands of posters, brochures, and booklets extolling the project's virtues and explaining why the city thinks that any attempts to alter the project could be defeated. Another powerful supporter is the Central Association, a group of downtown businessmen which dreamed up the project to begin with. A third strong supporter is the Seattle Times, whose president, W.J. Pennington, is also president of the Central Association. The project is also endorsed by Cairo, whose president, Lloyd E. Cooney, is vice president of the Central Association. This man heads another powerful force behind the project, the Central Park Plaza Corporation, a group of local investors which hopes to win the contract to develop the area. Attorney William B. Ferguson is chairman of the corporation's board of directors. Until recently, he was also chairman of the Central Association's Committee on Pike Plaza Development. The Central Park Plaza Corporation is a Washington corporation. It was organized in 1966 as a result of some conversations between Mayor Dorm Brayman, Mr. G. John Dosis, and myself, in which the mayor indicated that he would apply for urban renewal funds for the Pike Place market area if he were assured of one, at least one, developer. Among the original investors in the Park Plaza Corporation were A.L. Brock, assistant advertising director of the Seattle Times, and Dan Starr, publisher of the Seattle P.I which, like the Times, has strongly supported the urban renewal project. Both these men have subsequently withdrawn or sold their investment, but the corporation has apparently had little trouble attracting capital. Thus far, it has spent about $50,000 on preliminary design work. In addition, it has been buying up property and development rights within the urban renewal area and now controls about a dozen parcels of land. Within the past two months, another group supporting the city's plan has surfaced. Known as the Committee to Save the Market, the group held a press conference toward the end of August to announce the start of a campaign to defeat the Friends Initiative. According to Mike McEwen, the group's campaign coordinator, the Committee to Save the Market was organized to represent the market owners and merchants, and as proof of this, he pointed to the committee's stationery, which indeed contains a list of 37 market owners and merchants. The real origins of the Committee to Save the Market, however, will not be found by perusing the committee's stationery or by reading its campaign literature. They are found instead in a meeting which took place early this summer. The meeting involved just two people. One of them was a prominent member of the Central Association's Board of Trustees. The other was the president of a downtown advertising agency. The subject of the meeting was what could be done to defeat the Friends of the Market initiative. On July 28th, the advertising executive hired the services of a freelance public relations man named Mike McEwen, who was just finishing a job for the Chamber of Commerce. During the month of August, McEwen and his new employer attended a pair of breakfast meetings with a dozen downtown businessmen, including members of the Central Park Plaza Corporation. W.J. Pennington, the president of the Central Association, was also in attendance. None of the merchants listed on the stationery of the Committee to Save the Market was there. Shortly after these meetings, the committee launched a $65,000 campaign to defeat the Friends Initiative. Needless to say, that kind of money is not being put up by fruit peddlers and fishmongers. But until recently, the Committee to Save the Market refused a request from Check that it reveal its source of funds. On October 13th, Check announced this refusal at a news conference and on the following day, the Committee to Save the Market disclosed its list of contributors. The largest single contribution came from the owner of one of the market buildings, but by far the largest percentage of the total came from members of the Central Association 
and the Central Park Plaza Corporation. None of the money was contributed by the merchants listed on the stationery of the Committee to Save the Market. All of these facts, in turn, have prompted the supporters of the initiative to wonder whether there might be some connection between the Committee to Save the Market and the Central Association. But William Ferguson, speaking for the Association, denies that this is the case. There is no connection between the two groups. I'm sure that the Central Association is very sympathetic to what the Committee to Save the Market is doing. But that is the only real connection between the two. I think it's unfair to say that the Central Association is, is backing this program. As a matter of fact, they haven't financed this program. Around the middle of August, a number of letters went out to stores and business groups in downtown Seattle. The local chapter of the Washington State Wrestling Association, for example, received a letter from Frederick Dams, a stockholder in the Central Park Plaza Corporation and a member of the Central Association's Board of Trustees. In his letter, Dan stated that the Central Association was raising money for a campaign to defeat the Friends of the Market Initiative, and that the Association would like the downtown restaurants, hotels, and theaters to contribute $6,500 toward that goal. Checks should be made out, said Dan, to a group called Concerned Citizens to Save the Market. On September 30th, a local attorney took a deposition from Mike McEwen. During the course of that deposition, McEwen was asked the following question. What is the difference between the concerned citizens to save the market and the committee to save the market? McEwen, testifying under oath, replied, quote, The committee to save the market is the group that I work for. I have never heard of the concerned citizens to save the market, unquote. On September 27th, three days before this deposition was taken, McEwen was interviewed by Channel 4. Toward the end of the interview, McEwen was asked whether he had ever heard of a group called concerned citizens to save the market. Yes, that was, that was a forerunner of our group. That was just a, a suggested name that somehow got uh, into the press, I think, through uh, Emmett Watson's column in the PI. I was really confused with the Central Association and now another alliance of the Friends of the Market. Given a plethora of groups competing to win the merchant's allegiance, this man's statement is hardly surprising. Indeed, when questioned about the initiative measure, many of the merchants seemed honestly bewildered. I don't know what to say. Maybe, maybe it's all right, maybe not, I don't know. Well, I don't know what happened. It. <laughs> I've been confused myself for quite a while with all the talk that's going on in the market. Well, I'm a little bit indifferent. I, uh, I don't know which way to go. It took me quite a while, really, to, uh, to make up my mind, but... It was just last week that I decided to go with the Friends of the Market. The Friends of the Market is a group composed mainly of housewives, lawyers, and college professors led by Victor Steinbrook, a professor of architecture at the University of Washington. Supporting the Friends is a somewhat younger group of lawyers, doctors, and housewives known as the Alliance for a Living Market, which was organized in August to work for passage of the Friends Initiative. The initiative has also been endorsed by more than 100 merchants in the market area as well as the Pike Place Residents Association. Faced with opposition from all these quarters, the city recently proposed a modification of its urban renewal plan. The area known as the Pike Place Market to most people is, has been all along proposed for preservation, but there is an area between First Avenue and Pike uh, Place south of Pine Street that was proposed originally as a park or a public plaza with some market activities. We're now switching in terms of designation to a market use area will, will allow either rehabilitation or redevelopment of structures in that area for uh, market-oriented uses. Raymond's proposal, which will not be considered by the city council until after the election, was heralded in the Seattle Times as a major compromise. But there is some reason to wonder whether such a description is justified. For one thing, the area that Raymond referred to has always been set aside for market-related uses. In effect, the city's compromise consists mainly of shifting the proposed hotel 60 feet to the north. Well, uh, again, I, I really wouldn't call this a compromise. This is just, uh, this uh, proposal by uh, Mr. Brayman is simply <clears throat> an indication of uh, a willingness to, to modify certain portions of the urban renewal plan. It doesn't touch the hotel or the a very large area that's designated for hotel use, which is right on top of the market. 
Under the city's urban renewal plan, the hotel in question can be as high as 35 stories. And this fact has caused many observers to question the hotel's relationship to the two-story market building. It would be pretty outrageous to have a 30-story, 35-story hotel. As a matter of fact, right at this location, within uh, a very short distance of the low-scaled uh, uh, market buildings, and uh, instead of it phasing in gently and gracefully into the city scene and into the market, it will, it will, it will be a, uh, an island, skyscraper, high-rise island. The design is not an island in the city, but it's actually a part of the city and very close to the uh, heart of the city. Architect John Morris, a member of the city's design team, feels this plan is valuable for its variety. I think this is what makes a uh, uh, city exciting. We have all kinds of people, often very close together. They can be living near one another. Uh, people with one kind of income can be living near, quite close to those with other kinds of income. Large buildings can be close to small buildings. Two of the city's best-known architects, Fred Bassetti and Ibsen Nelson, disagree with Morris. Well, I've always felt that the whole market area needs a compatible development north of the market area. In other words, I don't see much relationship between a low building like the market is, essentially, with uh, towers for apartment living. I think that's essentially what has been troubling most people all along about the market. Well, the, this is the part that concerns me most. I feel the hotel is so large and so imposing that it encroaches on the market uh, enough to uh, have a very negative effect. Another question raised by the critics of the city's plan is, what would the plan mean for the market buildings to be renovated? That is, the L-shaped building on the west side of Pike Place and the corner market building across the street. That's impossible to tell, unfortunately. I've been in a number of meetings where city officials from the urban renewal uh, section of the Department of Community Development have been asked that specific question. And they have indicated that they do not have a structural study to indicate what kind of renovation is going to be necessary. Um, I suppose a lot of us would feel a lot more comfortable if the city could tell us what they're going to do, but they can't. Well, <clears throat> I wish I could precisely, because many people have this question. Uh, we also have underway now a mar market structural survey, which will tell us more precisely what needs to be done and how it can be done. If the renovation is extensive, market tenants will have to move out, and indeed the city assumes that all of them will have to do so at one time or another. Once the renovation is complete, tenants will, of course, be free to return. That is, if they can afford to pay the rents, which may be considerably higher than they were before. True, the city says it hopes to find a way to keep the rents down. Uh, that is another element in our plan, uh, providing that the rent structure should be maintained as closely as possible to that which exists now. We're going to have to do a lot of negotiating and working with the owners of the market on that subject. A brochure published by Brayman's department, however, gives little cause for complacency. In answer to the question, will market rents be controlled, the brochure states, the project cannot and does not propose any control of rents. Rents will continue to be strictly between the landlord and the tenant. Rehabilitation may result in some higher rents. Uh, unless there's subsidy, a terrific subsidy of some kind, that rent structure just has to go up. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, the redevelopment people, the urban renewal people, expect the rents to be the same. They never claimed they would be. Steinbrook's contention is supported by the city's economic consultants, whose study of the market predicted that rents after renovation would be about three times as high as they were before. Partly for this reason, the study also predicted that only about a third of the floor space in the renovated market would be occupied by existing tenants. As to the kind of tenants that might occupy the rest of the space, nobody really knows. But critics of the city's plan think they have a pretty good idea. The plans that have uh, been drafted indicate that the amount of space available to uh, farmers and other merchants who are, who are selling uh, produce, fish, meat, uh, and commodities of that nature would be uh, cut in half. The amount of uh, space that is devoted to uh, restaurants, nightclubs, specialty shops, etc., uh, will be doubled. Now, 
regardless of what they do to the physical structure, that plan and the change of uses suggests that the city within the 12 market structure is intending to create a market which is radically different from what we know at the present time. If you have a convention hotel uh, sitting on Pine Street, where Pine Street is at the present time, uh, you're going to start, uh, you're going to put a tremendous pressure towards developing uh, uses which would be auxiliary to that convention hotel. And these aren't the type of uses that we have now. And these wouldn't be the people that would buy produce. What sort of market area would emerge from all these changes, widespread demolition, high-rise apartments and hotels, rising rents, is a matter of conjecture and debate? Well, it would look quite different, of course. Uh, there would be newer buildings, for instance, rather than the warehouses and the older hotels that exist in the area right now. I think you're going to find a center of day and night life, uh, sort of an all-around uh, uh, activity center. I think you're going to find a harmonious view of the old and the, and the new. Well, this has been my concern and that of a lot of us for a long time, that it will destroy essentially the present character of the surroundings of the market. It's soft shoe, low key character. It's sort of accidental, interesting, casual, uh, delightful character. It's the very character that uh, Les Halles had in Paris that was torn down. It's very hard to do something new at a large scale that comes off successful in terms of people. I think that uh, the city's intentions in the urban renewal might be compared to that of a, um, uh, say, a doctor who's uh, decided that a patient is ill and uh, instead of uh, trying some milder treatments and pills and medication and so on, has just decided without a complete diagnosis to contemplate this major surgery on, on an area of the city that does need, it, does need help and uh, does need improvement, but the question is whether it needs this drastic, drastic thing that uh, is proposed under the present urban renewal plans. We don't believe it does, of course. What Steinbrook proposes instead is the establishment of a seven-acre historical district extending from the market buildings on the south to Virginia Street on the north. Within that district, all construction and renovation would be subject to approval by a 12-man board. Within the past few weeks, the Friends proposal has been endorsed by the Young Lawyer Section of the Seattle King County Bar Association, by the Central Seattle Community Council, and by the Montlake Community Club, as well as by CHECK. Among City Council candidates, it's supported by Tim Hill, John Miller, James Kimbrough, Bill Harrington, Jody McCracken, Sam Smith, and Bruce Chaplin. The first objection made to the Friends Initiative is that few of the buildings within the proposed historical district are really historic. The buildings to the north of the market building, for the most part, are not buildings of great historical content within the historical area that's being proposed, with the exception of the building that Ralph Anderson owns up on First Avenue, which I think is a nice historic building. The other buildings uh, along first are mediocre in architectural quality, and as you go down into western, become very uh, dilapidated buildings with questionable age. I would uh, agree that uh, the architectural importance of many of these buildings in the uh, uh, proposed Friends of the Market Initiative ordinance are not architecturally important. Uh, that ordinance, however, emphasizes market uses and uh, market activities. And that's the important thing, the retention of, of uh, those uses and enough space so that uh, these, these kind of businesses and activities will continue. And the humble and fragile nature of, of uh, the architecture is not nearly as important as what's going on in the building. And I, I can see some of these buildings being changed or torn down and, and rebuilt, uh, perhaps with more housing and so on, within the historic district of the initiative. We would expect that to happen. What the Friends would hope to see happen is something similar to what is now taking place around Pioneer Square, where an historical district was established a year and a half ago over the violent objections of the Central Association. There, old buildings are being restored, while new but compatible buildings go up around them. One reason this same process has not yet been duplicated in the market district 
could be that for the past eight years, the area has existed under the shadow of urban renewal. In other words, landlords are not interested in refurbishing buildings that are about to be demolished. Even so, new life is evident around the market. For example, in this coffee, tea, and spice shop, which recently opened at the corner of Western and Virginia, just outside the Friends Historical District. The other major objection raised against the Friends Initiative is that it would endanger the urban renewal project, thereby jeopardizing federal funds earmarked for restoration of market buildings. The best projections right now are that it would kill the program. Well, it would certainly uh, demand that the urban renewal plan be changed. That's very clear. Uh, there is no reason why it need kill the urban renewal plan. We assume and have good reason to believe that a modified urban renewal, a more sensitive urban renewal program could proceed. Our feeling is that it probably makes the urban renewal project, uh, as, as it is proposed, uh, infeasible. On October 18th, Lloyd LeBlanc, a member of the city's economic consulting firm, issued a report that Brayman had requested just two weeks before. According to LeBlanc's report, the project, as now proposed, is infeasible regardless. The reason for this is not the Friends Initiative measure, but simply the fact that the economic times in Seattle have changed. Because of this change, LeBlanc recommended that the new office buildings planned within the project be postponed indefinitely, and that the number of apartment units be reduced by half. From these modifications would emerge a scaled-down project, which, according to LeBlanc, could still be built, even if the Friends of the Market Initiative passes. I see a lot of room for compromise here, no matter what size the historic area is, is uh, actually calculated to be. The project can be built around the larger preservation area, or it can be built into the preservation area, given some changes within the overall area, or it can be built to one side uh, or at the other end. There is a way to build the entire project around the preservation area. One other way to accommodate the project would be to expand its boundaries to the north or east. If this were done, any number of hotels and apartments could be built without encroaching on the market. There's no final answer to the question of who, in fact, is trying to save the market. For the market is different things to different people. The city wants a market which is spruced up and made respectable so as to fit into a major hotel and apartment development. Supporters of Initiative One want a market which is casual, heterogeneous, and out of the ordinary. The difference between these two positions resolves itself ultimately in a question of values and taste. It becomes, in the end, a matter of what kind of market the people really want. Saving the market is really what the Urban Renewal Project is all about. One of the primary goals of our committee is to save the market. I, myself, want to save the market. But it's not just the market itself, it's the surroundings that need to be saved as well. That's very important. The Alliance wants to save the activities and environments which are created in the Pike Place market area. We would certainly like to keep the market. It's the soul of Seattle. It has to be saved.